je bila razlika između New Yorka i Chicago? New York je na dvije rijeke i na oceanu. A Chicago je na jezeru, kad pogledamo poslovni centar Chicago, isti je kao Manhattan. Treba dobro, dobro zagledati desetak, 15 sekundi da bi se vidjela razlika ko baš ovdje ne živi. I još je različito što je u New Yorku New York Times, a u Chicago Chicago Tribune. Evo nas kod zgrade vodećeg dnevnika u Čikagu. U strogom je centru, blizu jezera Michigan, djeluje močno kao i ovaj list s tradicijom od 160 godina. They include the travel section. They include the book section. Imamo jedinstvenu prigodu biti na sastanku uređivačkog kolegija. Kažu da nikada nisu pustili kameru unutra. And we usually um, go around the room asking people for their story ideas. Today, I was going to ask you guys to start off differently because uh, I'm just really curious what folks thought about the um, pit bull story. Mm-hmm. I don't remember reading. I couldn't read. Yeah. I started reading it. We know this and but there's nothing new in this story and so all you have is this shameless in in my estimation titillation about this boy getting chunks of meat mm-hmm. ripped out by these crazed dogs. I just, I didn't like the story at all. I started reading yesterday's and then it dropped back into the history of the family moving to the community. I thought, more than I need to know. So I skipped, skipped through it and tried to pick up the thread of actually what happened. But today, <clears throat> I thought, was a much more focused piece. But yesterday I had more time to read it and I was drawn as sort of prurient interest to read what happened when the kid came to the door. Today I was interested too, but realistically I didn't have time this morning to read it. So maybe I'll go back to it, but I'm not sure that I will. Well, that's the kind of story that we can be branded as, you know, the media sensationalizing. Right. Because there are constituencies that are so vehement about this. And whether it's a pit bull and you're doing this story to get into the larger issues of whether or not pit bulls are dangerous and should be controlled, or whether it's the child who was killed outside of Midway when the plane skidded off the runway. It's making something out of a family tragedy. And why pit bulls instead of Labrador Retrievers? Why this versus that? Why Sunday versus Monday? I'd be very interested in it. <laughs> Dnevne novine u Americi u nedjelju. Poprilično su teške, koštaju do 2 dolara. Tako izgleda Chicago Tribune, tako izgleda New York Times, Los Angeles Times. Ali je naslovnica nedjeljnog Chicago Tribuna izazvala polemiku u redakciji. Da su pitali hrvatske novinare, pa mi ovakvih priča o Pitbullu koji izgriza od dječaka imamo gotovo svakoga tjedna. Ako nije Pitbull, onda je Rottweiler. One guy lost a thumb for no, one of the dogs no, that first went nuts. And then yeah. one of the kids' relatives got some bites uh, as well. So it, it was, in fact, a, a rampage. But if the focus is the boy and how he's dealing with this and getting through this, then, then the headline, you know, the enduring agony of a, a, a pit bull rampage doesn't really get me to the boy. To me, the, the, it got a little bit dense when we started talking about the history of the dog. To me, there were like too, too, too many paragraphs there. Um, but I thought it was good. I sometimes wonder in stories like that if we, um, we give almost the entire front page to stories like that sometimes. And I wonder if, especially considering that it's such a heavy Um, and sad topic if we could shrink them down a little bit. I know we, we extend a lot of resources chasing them, but I don't think it means that we need to give over the entire front page, um, especially considering what readers are looking for on a Sunday. I don't know. It doesn't have the right visual presentation for me. No. I mean, you don't want a dishonest photo on something like this, but I think there's different ways to 
presented, and there's something, there's something, the stillness of that photo doesn't, it doesn't, I'm not saying put a grabber in there, because there's, to me, there, in the prose, there's way too much grabby prose yeah. for my taste about the chunks of flesh and all that. Ugh. Yeah. Don't need that, it, because that's it. like, leave that to television, you know. Chicago Tribune dio je veće kompanije Tribune u čijem je vlasništvu i Los Angeles Times nekoliko dnevnih listova, radio i televizijskih postaja, kao i baseball klub Cups iz Chicago. Imaju 23.000 zaposlenih, godišnji prihod od blizu 6 milijardi dolara. A opet cijeli sat raspravljaju o jednoj naslovnici. How can a major newspaper survive nowadays with the competition of uh, global networks, uh, internet, uh, and all the information that is bombing us? Well, obviously, it's a huge, huge challenge for American newspapers. There are about 1,500 daily newspapers in the United States, but the number of copies of all those newspapers, which are read every day, hasn't changed since about 1965. So the total amount of readership of the actual print newspapers has not gone up in 40 years, even though the country is much, much, much bigger now with about 300 million people. And even though when you count the number of people looking at our websites, it's a larger total audience, the number of folks looking at the newspaper, which they pay for, is actually about the same, even smaller. Um, I think the American newspaper industry has a huge challenge and at this point really doesn't know how to adapt to a dramatically changed I'm sure world. you know. No, 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 no. Or you have some idea. If, if I knew, I would get some Wall Street people to give me $10 billion dollars and I would, you know, start my own newspapers around the country. Um, how do you keep your traditional reader, who tends to be an older person, 55 years and older, how do you maintain your older reader and get a new young reader who is addicted to the internet, addicted to his iPod, addicted to television, and finds the newspaper gray and boring. It's very, very difficult. At the same time, we face a challenge every single day about how should we report the news in a world in which so often you can go on the internet, you can go on television and find out exactly what's happening, whether it's in the Balkans, whether it's in Lebanon, whether it's in Africa, even whether it's in your own hometown. You can find out hours and hours and hours and hours before we print what the story actually is. How can we do that story differently so when it shows up on your door in the next morning, or, or when you buy it at the train station the next morning, you don't go, oh, I, I already know that. I know that, that that bomb exploded in Baghdad and 10 Americans were killed. That's a, a very difficult challenge for us. People are somehow fed up with uh, tragic stories, with negative stories. On the other hand, they don't read positive stories. So what to do? Another difficulty is people always say, oh, you're so depressing. You're so pessimistic. You're always focusing on bad news. Then when you give them lots of upbeat news, they go, wait a second, I want real news. I want to know what's really going on in the world. So I think it's, it's quite inconsistent. It's quite hypocritical. And for us at newspapers, I suspect that uh, one of the answers will be to try to find a better mix in what we do, to try to cater to both of those very, very different desires on, on the part of people. Um. The Sunday edition of the Chicago Tribune brings you how much? About, about 60% of our revenues, weekly revenues, come from our Sunday paper. About 2 million people look at our Sunday paper. We print about 960,000 copies. But if you count all the people who actually look at it in a home and elsewhere, at a restaurant, it's about 2 million people. Our circulation, like the Sunday circulations of most American newspapers, are declining because people don't have enough time for us. They're more interested in leisure activities and entertainment and doing things with their family. And here comes our big paper, like this, five, ten pounds. And they go, oh my gosh, this is too much for me. I don't have the time. So our challenge is trying to figure out what to do with Sunday because for us, it is, uh, it is the most significant part of our operations, that Sunday paper. Mm-hmm. 
Nakon Čikaga, put nas vodi po žitnici Sjedinjenih država. Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Ogroman prostor, ali sve obrađeno. Soja, pšenica, kukuruz. Srednji zapad je američka žitnica. Tu se ne angažira jeftina radna snaga iz Meksika, tu su obiteljska gazdinstva. Vemo koliki je kukuruz ove godine, negdje 2 metra i 10 do vrha. Ali odmah preko puta su polja od soje koja će se koristiti za biodizel. Dakle, amerikanci već u naprijed planiraju energetsku krizu i traže rješenja. Sve se to radi u jednoj obitelji, rade otac, majka, sin, či. Prinosi nisu veliki, čak su manji nego u Hrvatskoj. Ali kad jedna obitelj radi na 200 hektara, onda znate što je zarada. Ovo je tipična farma. Pokraj kuće jezero koje služi i za navodnjavanje. Ima li koga doma? Ili su svi u polju? Naravno da nema. Ljudi rade. A što misli 500 građana Hrvatske u anketi Hendala koliko može jedna američka obitelj obraditi hektara? Do 20 hektara smatra više od 40%. Do 100 hektara reklo je više od 44%. A više od 200 hektara pogađa samo 15% ispitanih Hrvata u anketi Hendala. Pravi odgovor smo potražili od farmera. Tamo gdje smo ih zatekli kod kuće, bili su iznenađeni, ali veoma ljubazni. Dobri domaćini, kao da su naši. So what are you producing? Corn and beans. And we got hogs and cattle both. On how many acres? 560 acres. That's a lot. Can you do it with your family alone? Yeah. You don't employ others? Yeah, I, I got a... Uh, young boy at 16 that helped me once in a while. And you can do 560 acres alone? I am. So what do you do with the corn, with the other products? Uh, we dry it, with dry the corn and feed it to the livestock. You have livestock also? Yeah. How many? Oh, I don't know, we got uh, 40 cows and about 100 sows. And you do it alone again? Well, the, with the family here, yeah. yeah. And is the state, the government, subsiding for something? If the grain prices get low enough, they get LDPs that raise the price to the county average, so what it is. So they pay the difference? Yeah. If the grain prices are low and if they're high, then they don't pay anything. So, okay, so it's better if it gets high. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As a farmer, are you satisfied with the system of the economy in the United States? What would you change? <laughs> I don't know. I can complain, but uh, we got it pretty nice, I guess. Is it true that in this area, Some people are getting paid in order not to produce corn, not to produce something because it's already too much. Not here. There's other areas where the ground isn't quite as good. They got conservation acres they have. But here we don't. You consider yourself being a middle class, a lower middle class, upper middle class with your standard of living. Oh, middle class probably. And you can afford to send your kids to college if they want? Probably, but none of them did. And uh, do you have a chance to travel around the world sometimes, or around the United States? No, never have. Well, in the United States we have a little bit, but not around the world. So your longest trip is to Chicago? Uh, we've got relation to Kansas, so we go out there once in a while. So you work on how many acres? About 800. Alone, with the family? Pretty much by myself. I hire a little part-time help in the spring to put the crop in and in the fall to take the crop out, but it's pretty much me and my wife helps me some. Uh, 800 acres, corn, soya, what else? That's it, half of it corn and half of it soybeans. And what do you do with soybeans? Uh, I'm fortunate I live right next to the Mississippi River and so we haul them uh, right to the river. They're loaded on barges and taken down to uh, 
New Orleans, and they all end up in Rotterdam over in over in Europe. Oh, so you're selling to Europe? <laughs> yes. Uh, Madam, do you drive a tractor, a combine? Uh, on occasion, I do. When when there's a pinch or if some of the hired men are not around, I, I'll help out as much as I can. I'm not real savvy with it. Okay. So uh, how many hours a day do you work in average? Um, in the spring and in the fall is when it's labor intensive. Uh, in the spring and the fall, I'll put 16, 17 hours a day in that time of the year. But the rest of the year... You don't have to put that many hours in. I, I drive my semi uh, the rest of the year when I'm not putting the crop in or taking it out. And uh, what do you do in your spare time when you are free? Do you have any holidays, let's say two or three weeks holidays? Uh, we take trips. Our son and daughter-in-law live in Denver. Uh, we like to go out there. Our granddaughter is 10 years old. We like to take her on trips. So uh, we, we do traveling whenever we can. That's what we're doing this weekend is going to Indianapolis. How is to be a farmer's wife? Uh, it's gotten better over the years. I've, I've taken a more of an interest, so I understand it a little bit more. But it's good. We raised our kids on the farm, and um, it's been okay. If your kids wanted to go to the university, an expensive university, could you afford that? Well, actually, our son went to a private college and graduated. Um, he got a lot of scholarships and grants, but he came out with about uh, $20,000 in debt uh, through financial aid that he he's paying off right now. So he went to a very nice college, um, but because of his grades and because of his activities, he was able to get some scholarship money. Nije na Srednjem Zapadu samo biljna proizvodnja. Ovdje se uzgajaju i domaće životinje. How many did you buy? I just bought these five. Actually, I leased my building out to a guy, and he bought 170 yesterday. Okay, what's the price for the five? These five, these were pretty cheap because they were too big. Usually they buy them about 50 pounds, and they'll bring, I don't know, around a dollar a pound. But these here weighed 140, and I paid about $55 a piece for them. Da prevedem na hrvatski, svinja od 70 kila stoji ovdje samo 300 kuna. Mogu samo reći da američke svinje imaju isti miris kao i hrvatske svinje. Znate onaj miris svinski. Ide po kozu koja se one svješćuje. Nije do kraja uspjelo, samo je čudno poskočila. Just something in their, their bread that way. There's only, uh, I think I read there's like 2,000 purebred feigning goats in the United States. And... She's not registered, but she's got the genetics because she does that. Most of them, will fall, like I said, fall over on their back and their legs will stand straight out. But she's a little milder version of that. Od običnih i neobičnih životinja otac i sin prave socijalni život. Posjećuju školski razredi kojima daruju zanimljive primjerke. Tako farma nije samo rad od jutra do večeri, nego i druženje sa zajednicom. They're like, like pets. I mean, they come when you oh, come. Oh, yeah. Because we feed them bread. We get bread, day-old bread from a store, and we throw them out here. So they're waiting to be fed. <laughs> What would you like to become when you grow up? A farmer or a lawyer? I don't know. Uh, I don't, I'm kind of shy. I'm not too... I'm not like a people person, but probably more of a farmer than a lawyer. And you can live well with the farm. You're doing well? Yeah. You help your father? Yes. Can you drive a tractor? No, we don't have a lot of tractors uh, on this farm right now. Yeah. So. He's just learning. <laughs> can, you, can you feed these animals? Do you, yeah. like, do you like to feed them? 
Yeah, I like to. It's pretty easy. We feed the sheep bread once a day, and then we feed them grain, and uh, it's pretty easy. Do you think they eat too much? <laughs> I don't know. They need to eat a lot, but I guess sometimes they eat too much. <laughs> Posve drugčija filozofija poljoprivrede je na američkom jugoistoku. U Đorđi kombiniraju produktivnost i znanost. A ovdje u Đorđi sve u znaku breskve. Peach tree, drvo breskve, ima najmanje 80 ulica u okolici Atlante koje se zovu Peach Tree Street, Peach Tree Avenue, Peach Tree Square i tako dalje. Znaju se oni odužiti vočki koja ih je odhranila i na koje puno zarađuju. Međutim, Amerikanci ne bi bili Amerikanci kad ne bi nešto napravili što donosi veći profit. Pa onda pogledajte ovu bresku. Ona izgleda ovako. Zagrizete i pogledajte koštica. Gotovo da je nema. Kad cijelu bresku pojedete, koštica je ovolicna. Ko zna kakve sve genetske transformacije doživjela ova breska, da je bila ovako ukusna, ovako bez koštice. Ne znam hoće li biti uvezena kod nas, znam ko će biti protiv. Kolegica Branka Šeparović prva. Ali odemo li dalje na američki jugozapad, u New Mexico, Arizonu i Kaliforniju, vidjet ćemo ogromna polja navodnjene pustinje, gdje rezultat ovisi najviše o Meksikancima. Ovo je jedan dio američke poljoprivredne filozofije. Ogromna polja, dobro navodnjavanje i vrhunska salata, vrhunski proizvod. Sve su iste, sve su jednake boje. A da vidimo ko su vlasnici. Vlasnici su uglavnom došljaci iz prošloga stoljeća, negdje s početka, koji kad je došla voda, uspjeli su poljoprivredno razviti ovaj kraj. Vlasnici izgledaju ovako, kao ovaj gospodin, ali sve je bazirano na jeftinoj radnoj snazi koja stiže uglavnom iz Meksika. Koliko ovi Meksikanci mogu zaraditi za jedan dan, berući salatu na užarenim poljima? Opet smo napravili anketu među 500 Hrvata koji misle ovako. 10 dolara dnevno, tako misli gotovo 60% anketiranih. Do 50 dolara dnevno, nešto više od 30%. A da zarađuju do 100 dolara na dan, reći će tek svaki deseti hrvatski ispitanik. A točan je ovaj posljednji odgovor. Se ga nabijen? Si, si se ga nabijen, si se ga nabijen da to odnosi. Se pojeden ganar mil dolara por mes? A, o, si. Si, si, bolo regular de, pues, por decirlo así, cuando está el trabajo regular, ganan como un promedio de 100 en un día, o sea, 90, 80, 100, está variado, depende de lo que se trabaja. Pero no trabajan el sábado y el domingo en general. No, casi por lo regular, el sábado a veces sí, cuatro horas, un rato, pero por lo regular no, por lo regular, el domingo es el que sí, casi por lo regular nunca. Porque se va a la mesa, ¿no? Sí. Y esa gente después de dos, tres años viviendo así, ¿habla ya el inglés? No, casi por lo regular no se acostumbra mucho el inglés. O sea, aquí por lo regular casi por lo, es español lo que hablan. Casi ¿Y por... los niños tienen niños ellos? Sí, tienen niños, van a la escuela, los niños pues sí hablan inglés, eso sí. No, no, no están en el film, eso están estudiando para trabajar en otra clase de trabajo. Entonces el chico viene a casa, habla inglés y la mamá dice, para, hay que hablar español. Habla español para entender. To je ono što se promijenilo u Americi. Meksikanci više nisu teška sirotinja koja radi za par dolara dnevno. Ovdje se može zaraditi stotica svakoga dana. Rad je težak, ali u Meksiku je težak, a tamo se plaća pet puta manje. Ovi ljudi rade četiri mjeseca ovdje na jugu Kalifornije, pa se sele na jug u Jumu, u Arizonu, na još pakleniju vrućinu, a dva su mjeseca doma u Meksiku. Dok rade u Americi, stanuju u ovakvim kam prikolicama. Obično po dvoje u jednoj, zašto plaćaju 15 dolara dnevno, dakle 7,5 dolara po osobi. Za taj novac imaju klima uređaj, besplatnu struju i vodu. S još 10 dolara dnevno mogu se pristojno hraniti, jer ovdje 15 kokoših jaja stoji 6 kuna. 
jedan dolar. To je na 200 metara Meksička granica. Kontrola nije tako rigorozna, ali ipak ilegalni migranti, kad bi probali, vjerojatno ne bi uspjeli. Ako izgledaju kao Meksikanci, zaustave ih, traže im papire. Ako izgledaju kao Šveđani, Norvežani, puste ih proći. Kako mi imamo puno opreme i trebamo puno carinskih prijeva, nismo prelazili tu granicu jer bi izgubili pola dana. Povećane nadnice privlače sve više Meksikanaca, pa je ilegalan prijelaz granice teško kontrolirati. Gledamo patrona kola graničara, kako kao jastrebovi silaze s brda s kojih nadgledaju granicu. Čini se da će nekoga uloviti u ovom kamp naselju. Evo, privode ih. Jo tengo entendido, o I have, my understandings are that they actually work and they send money to Mexico as well as we have some tenants are actually, you know, sending money and I guess you can say so they can better themselves, you know, Mexico. Mexico is, I guess they need a new government. I'm not so sure. I can't really, that's my opinion, you know, because of the, I guess, the money, you know, the income is not coming in very well. So that's why we have a lot of them coming across trying to, you know, find a better job so they can actually, you know, I guess, make a better living out there as we are. Like I say, it's an American dream. You know, we all want that dream and we look for it. How close are you from the American dream? Um, actually, within two years, hopefully, so I get get my bachelor's degree, <laughs> so I can be a, you know, working a bit in a different area, maybe with the criminal justice. So, let's see. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. It was good talking to everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Zanimljivo mišljenje o reguliranju ilegalnog useljavanja iznio je naš Konor Vlakančić, neuspjeli kandidat za senatora Kalifornije. I have a specific solution for that. It is dramatically emphasized on my website, my campaign website. What you are describing about immigrants and comparing that to the current situation, there are immigrants and then there are migrant workers. They are not necessarily the same people and they differ dramatically from the Europeans that came here, my grandfather when I came here, when, when, excuse me, when he came here. Such immigrants came to the United States leaving behind everything. They came here to be Americans, to assimilate into Americana. My grandfather did not teach me my Croatian heritage because he only thought in terms of here now in America, this is what we are. The migrant workers from Mexico that are coming here, yes, some of them, some of them are coming here to be immigrants, but the vast majority come here to be migrant workers. So what I have proposed, and it has been circulated in Congress as part of their consideration a blue card not a green card green card to to be here as an illegal migrant worker and to be rewarded with unconditional amnesty of citizenship that's not okay with Americans but to come here as a migrant worker with a blue card the freedom to come and go between the United States and Mexico as an honorable person, earning a living, paying taxes, and having a blue card. Never to be a citizen, but to be here honorably as a worker. That is a specific proposal that is currently being considered on, in, on Capitol Hill. Teško je Meksikancima objasniti zašto nisu dobrodošli. Pa cijela Arizona, Južna Kalifornija, gdje danas rade kao nadničari, bile su Meksičke zemlje. San Diego nisu osnovali Amerikanci, nego katolički misionari koji su došli iz Meksika. Na ovom mjestu, u starom dijelu San Diego, rođena je Kalifornija, 1769. katolički svećenik Junipero Serra osnovao je misiju i tada je San Diego brojao 250 stanovnika. 1846. 
Amerikanci su potjerali Meksikance i katolike i podigli američku zastavu. A kako su u Americi dolazi do legalnih papira, do takozvane zelene karte, koja daje pravo boravka, gotovo sva prava kao da ste američki državljanin, osim mogućnosti glasovanja na izborima. Odgovor smo tražili u ovoj zgradi u središtu Čikaga kod odvjetnika koji je bio prvi predsjednik gradskog rotari kluba, a koji zna kako se vara sustav, premda se veli osobno time ne bavi. Some 20 years ago when I was here, I knew a Macedonian guy and he was able to provide a green card for $2000. You would pay him $2000 and you would get the green card. All right, he went to jail. He went to to jail for four years he served 16 months but how did he do it he never told me but you should know as a lawyer how do you buy a green card for 2000 or today it would be probably 10000 well because the immigration system in the united states is broken and needs a lot of reform this is fertile ground for people to have a black market type of system in place for paperwork for marrying. For example, if you are a young Polish woman who comes in as a tourist, decide that you like it here. And one of the only ways that you can do it is to be able to marry a US citizen. So there is a black market for people for American citizens selling themselves to lie to the to the officials at the INS now called the USCIS to say yes, we met, we love and we're together now. So if you are a if you're a young Polish woman and you're looking at this black market, if you find a US citizen who is of Polish background and can still speak Polish as well as English obviously, $15,000. If the man is not of Polish origin and cannot speak Polish, then it's $10,000. If it's a black man, it's $5,000. Now, there are a lot of instances of these types of of black market things going on such as your friend the Macedonian who was able to produce the green card for $2000. Now, because of the amount of biometric data that is now being included in these US permanent residency cards as opposed to 20 years ago when they were just green cards with a picture on it, it's making it a lot harder to forge those documents. But the the danger is is that because of this black market network is being allowed to multiply in the United States when because of this broken immigration system this can certainly be a way because they're becoming more sophisticated the forgers this can certainly become an avenue for potential terrorists to use their services to be able to, able to obtain immigration documentation to be able to come and carry out any type of terrorist attack in the United States so that's a huge concern for the US government at this time. I opet idemo na američki zapad. U San Diego je toliko Meksikanaca da je američkim vlastima teško razlikovati tko je tu ilegalno, a tko ima uredne papire. Od milijun i 300.000 stanovnika San Diega, svaki treći je Meksikanac ili latinoamerikanac. Ovaj se restoran reklamira kao najstariji u gradu, najstariji u San Diego. E sad ćemo vidjeti, to je meksički restoran, mali meksički restoran La Pinata. Ući ćemo unutra i provjerit ćemo koliko je doista star. This being the oldest restaurant dates back to 1928. And it's been continuously a Mexican restaurant here. And so, you are not a Mexican yourself? No, I'm not. No, I I think everybody else is, except for our Ukrainian hostess. <laughs> Pero habla español con esa gente o no? Oh, un poquito, no más. Vino de México hace mucho tiempo? Cuatro años. Bueno, ¿y qué espera hacer después en la vida? ¿Quedarse aquí o estudiar, trabajar? Pues no sé, aquí me va muy bien. Porque viene mucha gente a comer, este, dan buenas propinas y este, la gente es buena. En México no ganaba mucho y aquí sí, aquí sí gano mejor. Entonces está contenta. Estoy contenta, muy contenta. 
¿Piensa tener familia aquí o ya la tiene? No, ya soy abuela. Tengo tres nietos. ¿Qué es? Abuela. I'm grandmother. I have four, four children. My, my youngest is 80, my oldest is 25. And uh, my granddaughter, my oldest is five years. And my youngest son, kid's grandson, is uh, one year. When did you get married? Oh, when I was young, 17 years. And uh, right now I divorced, but I feel good. A Catholic and divorce, that's not good. <laughs> Ugodna je šetnja San Diego. Vidi se da ovaj grad ima povijesti. Starosjedioci su bili indijanci iz plemena Kumejaja, ali su grubo iseljeni nakon zlatne groznice sredinom 19. stoljeća. Zgodno je gledati tržnicu sa suvenirima u starom dijelu grada. Ovdje na zapadu Amerikanci se rado vraćaju u prošlost, premda je stara samo 250 godina, od kojih samo 160 američkih. Ali uvijek su tu zastave da pocijete tko je ovdje gazda, premda je većina natpisa na španjolskom jeziku. Luka San Diego matična je za američku ratnu mornaricu. Četiri su se ratna broda u povijesti zvala San Diego. Oko grada su plaže u dužini od 100 km. Ovako danas izgleda poslovni centar San Diego, ali je manje poznato da je između 1885. i 88. ovdje veliki investitor bio šerif Vaja Terp. Nakon obračuna u Tomstonu kod Oki Korala, znate ono Doc Holiday i ostali, došao ovdje sa trećom suprugom Josie, otvorio četiri saluna i četiri kockarnice. Jako je bio uspješan, kasnije investirao u nekretnine i danas, evo rekoh, Centar San Diego, poslovni centar, izgleda ovako. Za Hrvate, San Diego je poznat po još jednoj priči. Ovdje je dugo živio ministar unutarnjih poslova NDH, Andrija Artuković, sve do izručenja Jugoslavije. Razgovarali smo s njegovim sinom. Do you know where the grave of your father is? Mogu vam reći da to ne znam. Ja sjetim kad moj otac umro u 1988. da sam ja sjedio i govorio sa predsjednik sudska vijeća, gospod Gajski, kom ja sam ga pitao za tatinu Leše i on mi rekao da to je mene zabranjeno, da ja to ne bi nikad saznao. I do današnji dan nemam pojma što se dogodilo. Osjećate li vi neku gorčinu i prema današnjoj Hrvatskoj zato što je ta priča zaključena, zato što vi ne znate gdje je grob vašeg oca? Ja imam nekoliko, ja osjećam nekoliko stvari. Prvo, toliko naši ljudi su pretrpili puno više, ogromno više nego smo mi kao obitelj Artuković doživjeli. Puno hrvatsko obitelji su izgubili oca, majka, brata, sestra u vrijeme drugog svjetskog ratu, posle i u zadnju oslobodilačku ratu u 90. godine. Pa ja ne mogu usjećati da, da, da sam nešto škodilo. Ja gledam na ocu kao dio povijest, dio hrvatski povijest i a, ja tražim, ja bi tijel znati gdje je on, što se dogodilo s njim, i ja vjerujem da jedan dan mi ćemo to saznat i da mi ćemo svršiti to, mi ćemo moći ga naći i sahnariti. Jeste li ikada pomislili, ipak taj režim Ustaški nije bio baš nježan prema svojim protivnicima, da je vaš otac kao ministar unutarnjih poslova 
imao nekog udjela u tim zločinima koji su bili u Jasenovcu i tako. Ja sam puno o tome mislio, jer kad sam ja prvo gledao u ovu problematiku od moju strane i da razumijete, to je iz američke gledište. Ja sam više manje odgojen ovdje i gledam na stvari više manje kao amerikanac. Pa sam ja išao istraživati što su ovi ljudi ko su protiv tati, ko ga optuživaju za stvari, od kud su oni to dobili i sve i svašta. To je, za meni nije to crno ni bijelo, nego imao, uh, and I forget the word for gray, uh, 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 smeđu. Sivo. Sivo, ok. <laughs> Sivo. I, uh, i uh, ja znam za ove optužbe što Jugoslavia ga optuživala, i za što on je bio izručen konačno u 86. godini, ove a, točke od izručenja nisu ni dogodile jer su zapisnike bili lažne. Ali imate pravo da ima jedno veće pitanje. To znamo da puno se desilo u to vrijeme i ne samo u NDH, nego u Srbiju, kao i kroz čitvom Evropu. I ja vjerujem da moj otac osobno bio čovjek, dobar čovjek u slabo vremena. On je prvo bio za Hrvatsku. I njegove uh, pogledi bilo da kako bilo da bulo, uh, kako bide, bude da bide. Kako bilo da bilo. There we go. Uh, da Hrvatska kao jedna zemlja može, može izaći iz rata. I onda ćemo srediti sve probleme. Nedvojbeno, to nije bilo demokracija, to ti je bila diktatura. I a, kad dođe na pitanje Jasenovcu, ja mislim da su zakone jasne tamo da nije on imao ulogu tome. You spend almost all your life in the United States. You, I assume, feel American. Are you proud to be a crowd? You bet. <laughs> Very proud. I dalje se vozimo prema Los Angelesu. Cesta je široka, po šest traka u svakom pravcu. I uvijek je gužva. U sljedećoj emisiji vidjet ćete najveću hrvatsku katoličku crkvu kako je postala oaza usred kineske četvrti. Vidjet ćete kakav restoran ima Goran Milić u luksuznom dijelu Santa Monica. Poštovani gledatelji, doviđenja do idućeg tjedna.